Good morning, all. It is good to come into the presence of the living God with you. It is good to know that at all times we are always under the watchful eye before the face of our loving Father. And indeed, in his presence as his spirit dwells within us. Praise God for that. We are servants of the living and true God in a world that is full of alternative gods. The nations, they worship their idols, but we know that the idols of the peoples are nothing. And so, today, we've got somebody bringing us something. Looks like we dropped. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Today, we are going to discuss a gospel of fire and brimstone. Or, you could title it simply, Kiss the Sun. Now, the historical context for today is the Olympic Games. Who is familiar with the recent kerfuffle surrounding the Olympics by raised hand? Anybody? See a number of a number of folks. So if you aren't familiar with, of course, I'm sure everyone's familiar with what the Olympic Games are, right? So this last Well, current. It's going on right now. The Olympic Games that are going on right now, they had their opening ceremonies, I believe, on Friday. And Paris, France is hosting the Olympic Games. And the opening ceremonies were full of uh, unspeakable sexual perversion and blatant blasphemy of Christ. I mean, straightforward, just in your face, blasphemy of Christ. And... uh, pagan imagery and all sorts. It was just a parade of absolute godlessness. It would be hard to imagine how you could make it worse, basically. I I wouldn't recommend that you go watch the videos, but all you got to do is is Google it and you get a picture. One of the most iconic images coming out of it is, you remember the iconic painting, uh, I think it was Da Vinci, of the Last Supper? You remember that painting? Oh yeah, thank you. Yes, the painting that's redone in the what knitting or whatever needlework that that picture right there is the iconic painting of Jesus and the disciples all seated at the long table. They redid, redid that image, except that the table is, it's all drag Queens and lesbians and extremely indecently dressed people, but it was a direct duplication of that image. So it was straightforward mockery of Christ and of the Christian faith. And that wasn't the only, that was the most iconic image to come out of it. But they also had the large golden head of a, of a bull, a large golden calf head on stage. They had something which appeared to be a pale horse as part of their opening ceremonies. They have a rider on a pale horse, like riding up from the water. All these weird references to biblical symbolism in an extremely irreverent and mocking or just straight up demonic and satan worshiping sort of way now we know that that's not an isolated incident that is simply the latest high watermark of the high-handed rebellion of the humanist kings of the nations but the broader context is that we just came off of pride month in america these sorts of things they happen at at regular interval intervals and we do see every once in a while these remarkable beyond the pale expressions, so to speak, these it's worse than we've ever seen before, but it's just continuing on the trajectory. It's just until the next, they can figure out the next one to be even more transgressive. It wasn't that long ago that it was the, I forget which awards ceremony it was that had the guy who was dressed up as the devil and the song for the awards ceremony was entitled Unholy and it was the whole, I think, was it the Oscars, the Grammys? It was one of those. And The whole thing was like a scene from hell. That wasn't that long ago that that was the transgressive thing. The Olympics made that look mild by comparison. This is how sin works. It descends into the abyss. So we are not under the delusion that what happened in Paris is some isolated incident. We recognize that we in America are just as guilty and doing things that are just as anti-Christ. That is the historical context in which we dwell. 
So the question is, how are we as the church supposed to react to these sorts of things? How do we faithfully preach the gospel? It has been interesting watching the reaction to the opening ceremonies of the Olympic Games. There has been a lot of uproar, and rightly so, and in some ways that's been heartening. There have been plenty of Christians and even non-Christians saying, what in the world was that? That was unacceptable. That was disgusting. That was wrong. That was beyond the pale. But then you have, it's just interesting watching the discussion play out. And you have people like Mitt Romney who post about how wonderful the opening ceremonies were at the Olympic Games. This is our Republican presidential candidate from a few cycles ago. And he said, oh, it was a beautiful, culturally rich experience. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, it's the kind of culture that you get from hell. Definitely rich in that kind of culture. Those are not the men that we should be putting in positions of authority. That is not what God-fearing men say after watching that parade of perversion. So we have, though there have been some Christians who have been speaking out against it, a, a good amount of them. In fact, who remembers Harrison Butker? Remember the kicker? Kansas City Chiefs, a couple months ago, got in a ton of hot water because he gave the commencement speech, and he basically said that he, he's a Catholic. It was at a Catholic college, and he said, the highest honor for women is to be wives and mothers. God designed you for that. I'm so thankful for my wife that she does that. And, of course, he was raked over the coals for saying that. Well, now, after the Olympic ceremonies... He tweets out, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, this he will also reap. And all I can say is, I'm with that guy. I I hope God leads him out of his Catholicism. But amen. He's saying things that need to be said. And to come back and say that after being boiled by the the media a couple months ago for saying things about biblical gender roles, that's courage. So praise God for people like that. More of that, please. We do have some Christians who are doing that, and even non-Christians, it's been interesting seeing the non-Christian reactions, who remembers Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate, not a Christian, doesn't claim to be a Christian. He's a Muslim, and he's a wicked man. I mean, wicked, unacceptably evil, advocates all sorts of terrible stuff. He also gets some things right. He's one of those where he's a very mixed bag, because some of what he says is, is... incredibly spot on, but then other things that he says are absolutely just degenerate. So do not recommend or support him at all. But I saw a video of him. Uh huh. But he's the male influencer, patriarchal, abusive patriarchy kind of. Yes. Yeah. If you wanted to see an example of, of patriarchy in the abusive manifestation, it would be Andrew Tate. Not trying to be Christian, not trying to be loving to women. He just uses them up, chews them up, spits them out. Uh, very much red pill, men need to be masculine. And so he'll say stuff about men needing to be masculine that's good and correct. But then the way he talks about women and his sexual uh, values, morality, absolutely abominable. Anyway, he, there's a video of him talking to this, the person behind the camera who sounds like a Christian who's talking to him, friend, whatever. They're talking about this thing in Paris, this debacle in Paris. Andrew Tate's talking about how, like, why are you Christians not doing anything? Why, why do you just, what, what are you supposed to do? Just turn the other cheek? Is that all you're supposed to do? Like, why is this, France was supposed to be a Christian nation. You guys do nothing. You're just, you're weak and spineless and toothless. And, and at the end of the day, I'm left thinking, he's kind of right. He's kind of right. Now, we know that him coming from Islam He does not have a part in his worldview that we do have as Christians of turning the other cheek. There is a precious and important biblical doctrine of loving our enemies, of turning the other cheek, of being kind to even even to the wicked, of praying for our persecutors. We don't skip over that. At the same time, to have a bunch of these non-Christians, Andrew Tate tweeted out, he said, I will never forgive these scumbags for how they dishonored Jesus Christ. That was Andrew Tate, the Muslim. Now, we as Christians, we don't value lack of forgiveness. That's not the right moral to take away. It's not, oh yeah, I want to be bitter, just like that Muslim guy. No, no, it's not, I will not forgive them. However, it does seem that we're lacking a category for all those who hate thee, I hate, and I hate them with a perfect hatred. And that's straight out of scripture. We need to have that category. And it is a valid rebuke, even if it comes from the godless, 
when they're looking at the church saying, you guys just going to sit down and take this? We have been so discipled into a dispensational pietism. We're so disconnected from this world that we think, well, for me to be a good Christian means I just roll over and take everything because Jesus said, turn the other cheek. And that's as far as our theology goes. Jesus did say, turn the other cheek. We do need to have a heart that prays for those who persecute us. We do know that we're going to be mocked and slandered. We, that's part of the deal. We accept that. But you can't just take those texts out of Scripture and build your framework for interacting with an anti-God world only off of those passages. What does it look like to faithfully and fully and courageously preach the gospel? When are we supposed to turn the other cheek? Jesus turned over tables. That has to be in our framework too. Jesus could have just walked in there meek and mild and said, oh, you guys really shouldn't be doing this. And then they would have said, get out of here. And he could have said, oh, I'm going to turn the other cheek and leave. And that's kind of all that our dispensational, pietistic worldview allows us to do now. That's what the Christians are supposed to do. We kind of state our case in a meek and mild way, hope people listen. And if they don't, then we've been persecuted. Yay, we are blessed. Well, we're missing something here. Jesus made a whip out of cords. He planned ahead to walk in there and clean house. And he did it like a man. And he threw over some tables and he chased some people. And it was, I would not have wanted to mess with Jesus in that moment. Okay. That needs to factor into our understanding of preaching the gospel. And scripture is full of men who did that sort of thing and were blessed by it. Phineas sees people making a mockery of God right there in front of everybody, right there in the temple. And what does he say? Excuse me, guys, could you please not do that? That's really not, that's really not the, the most moral. That doesn't really represent traditional values. Would you please go take that to your private bedroom? No. He said, where's a spear? I need that spear. And he went over and he took care of business. And God blessed him for that. That needs to be part of our understanding of gospel presentation. So let's walk through some texts. The question we need to ask is, what kind of revival are we looking for? What is the gospel that we are preaching? Do we really understand the full picture of what the Bible says is the gospel? Because this is gospel-driven. It's all about the gospel. Right. It's all about Christ. That is what... This all boils down to, that is why the Olympics are mocking Jesus. Because it is only in Christ that there is life and light and power. The kingdom of darkness does not need to mock other religions because the other religions are worshiping idols and demons. They're on the same team. Jesus is their enemy. I saw a tweet from a Twitter account named Satan. The name of the Twitter account is Satan saying, one abortion 2,000 years ago, and this whole mess would have been solved. Which is, of course, blasphemous and wicked and so on. But I kind of liked that tweet, though. Because if you stop for a second and think about what he's saying, excuse me, are you admitting that because of the birth of a baby 2,000 years ago, Amen. you're falling apart? Right. Because you're right, you're accurate, because that baby was born, because Jesus came, the kingdom of darkness is crumbling. And that is what this is about. It's all about spiritual warfare. So we need to jettison the lie of secularism that we bought into and we thought that this was all just kind of like political machinations where we can all just kind of debate our moral values separate from religion. It is all about worship. It always was about worship. The Olympics are just making evident what has always been the case. And it has only gotten this far because we in the church forgot that this was the case at the very beginning. We should have been saying all along, our, our Olympic Games, they start with the Christian Pledge of Allegiance. We raise the Christian flag and we sing a mighty fortress is our God. That's how we kick off the Olympic Games. That should, we, how did we ever stop thinking that way? People now are all in, a, all in an uproar about Christian nationalism. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. It's not blessed is the nation whose morality is traditional. That, that doesn't, that's not it. It was always spiritual. So, what does gospel presentation look like? It's two parts. Two parts, but both parts start with one thing. 
The gospel starts with the kingship, the authority of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 28. We all know the Great Commission. We're very comfortable with the Great Commission. We think of the Great Commission as just an exhortation to go pass out gospel tracts. And I am not knocking passing out gospel tracts. In fact, I could do with passing out more gospel tracts. It is never a bad idea to evangelize more. I am certainly not detracting from the need to tell that guy on the street about Jesus. Or have your neighbor over for dinner and ask them what they think about God. And get into that conversation. Absolutely essential. We cannot flee from the dispensational pietism over to the holy huddle of post-millennial borough building to where, okay, I don't need to evangelize. I'm just teaching my children and we're making a Christian society. Well, Jesus had a heart for the lost. So should we. But that's not the full picture. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. How does the Great Commission start? How does the great go evangelize statement of Scripture start? Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, because of that, because I'm the king, because I have all the authority and I rule over all the things, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, you can take that word, all the nations, however you want. You can say that's talking about bringing individuals out of the nations. I don't really care. I'm not going to argue with you about that. The point is, whatever gospel we're preaching, it's a gospel that's rooted in the fact that Jesus is the king. It's not a gospel rooted in the fact that Jesus is hoping that he can wipe the sweat off your brow. Now, Jesus does offer the fullness of joy in his presence. But that's not where it starts. It starts with kiss the son or perish. He's the king. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Acts 2.36, another passage I want to look at. This is gospel presentation by Peter. Acts 2.36, he's preaching a sermon, and he says, he goes through his whole sermon, he concludes this sermon with this. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Oh wait, he doesn't say that. What does he say? He says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And that is the gospel. You killed him. He's the king. You should be scared. And that's the gospel. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. There's the good news. He's ready to go with the good news. He's happy to tell them the forgiveness is right there waiting for you. But it's not just forgiveness that's kind of floating over here that we recommend you accept. You're at enmity with the risen Lord. That enmity can be solved through his blood. Come to the feast. But if you don't, then I'm going to tell you the truth. And part of the problem is that our dispensational pietism has reduced our gospel presentation simply to, okay, but one day you will go to hell. And that is true. And that is chilling. And understood correctly, that is the highest and most powerful motivation. I want eternal life with Christ, not eternal torment under the wrath of God. But God is not... He doesn't operate based on this dualistic dichotomy between the material world and the spiritual world. Yes, there is literal hell to pay if you do not turn to Christ in the eternal life to come. But also, he will break you now. Also, God judges nations now, in this world, in this life. It's not just a matter of, you're going to be fine for now, 
but eternity one day, you're going you're gonna to answer to Jesus. That's true too. But what do we tell kings? What do we tell nations? We tell nations, kiss the sun or you're going to perish. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. That's how the Bible talks to kings. That's not just talking about going to hell one day. That's talking about barbarians climbing your walls and burning your homes down and carting off your families. Shame on the church if we have not warned people, if we have not proclaimed the king reigns and he brings justice and you mock him at your peril. So the two parts of gospel presentation are kiss the son and come to the feast. And those go together. You don't get one without the other. Either by itself is not the full presentation of what scripture says. So we see come to the feast in, in plenty of places. We just read that from Acts chapter, chapter 2. We see it in plenty of other places. I'm just going to give you the references. You can look at them. Matthew, or Acts 8.36, Matthew 11.25, where Jesus says, Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. There is an invitation to peace and life in Christ. Amen. But that is not absent of the proclamation that you must kiss the sun or perish. We see that. We just read that. Acts 2.34. I'll read a couple other verses to illustrate that. Acts 7.51. This is, this is Stephen's. See, Stephen did a really bad job being winsome. You ever thought about that? You ever thought about how terrible Stephen did in his gospel presentation? He really missed his opportunity to win people to the faith, didn't he? And if he had just kept a lid on it a little bit, he might have even not been stoned to death. And that is how the church talks about how we're supposed to preach the world. Stephen doesn't pass the American Evangelical Gospel Presentation Test. Well, I'd rather be with Stephen. I'm going with Stephen. I'm going with the one who looks up to heaven and sees Jesus standing to receive him. That's my model for gospel presentation. And how does he end his gospel presentation? It's with this. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become, you who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. That's preaching the gospel. Revelation 18, 1 through 8. And I'm not reading this for eschatological reasons. I'm simply reading this for a picture of how God speaks to nations. Revelation chapter 18. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird for all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back, even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensually, sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I am not a widow and will never see mourning. For this reason, in one day her plagues will come pestilence and mourning and famine and she will be burned up with fire for the Lord God who judges her is strong and he is the same yesterday and today and forever and the nations still sit under his watchful eye and will still receive from his judgment seat psalm 2 why do heathen nations rage why do people's folly mind kings of earth and plots engage rulers are in league combined And what is the message given back to them? Kiss the son, his wrath to turn, lest ye perish in the way. For his anger soon will burn. Blessed are those who on him stay. Psalm 110. 
The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. This is part of gospel presentation. Showing God for who he is. Speaking his word as he has spoken it. Proclaiming the gospel of the king. The reigning king. Think of Jonah. Jonah is sent to Nineveh. A city that is rife with debauchery and sin. And what does Jonah say? We're given one sentence. Gospel presentation a la Jonah. And Jonah, I mean, not, I'm not saying that he's a paragon of, of the attitude that we want to embody when it comes to our evangelism. But what is it that he says? One sentence. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. I mean, as far as what we're given in scripture, that's all he says. And boom. Revival. God uses that one sentence of God is going to smash you. And God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, sets the fear of God in the heart of that people so that they repent. And once they repent, what? Come to the feast. God has turned from his wrath. You can be forgiven. Nineveh will will no longer be destroyed. But that comes after yet 40 days. And Nineveh will be overthrown. Read Isaiah chapter 1. Read Micah chapter 1. Read all of the prophets. How do the prophets speak to the kings? The wrath of God is boiling against you for your wickedness. And he's going to hand you over to the barbarians. It's like the consistent message of the prophets throughout the Old Testament. Why do we think we're not? No, we don't talk like that anymore. Why? Has God changed? Is he any less king now? Is he any less against sin now than he was before? Gospel proclamation must be individual and national. It must be personal and political. We must recognize that the judgments of God are personal and eternal, but they are not only personal and eternal. The judgments of God deal in terms of nations, families, communities, and as such, it is our duty as Christians to faithfully proclaim, thus saith the Lord, not, not from a position of weakness, not trying to bargain with them to hopefully like us and give us a seat at the table. No, from a position of ambassadors for Christ. Who's Christ? He's the king. Unchallenged, seated at the right hand of power. His reign is not going up for election. It's unquestionable. The earth will be full of his glory like the waters cover the sea. And that's how we should be presenting the gospel. Amen. It should be kiss the sun or be crushed. And to those who are willing to kiss the sun, now come to the feast. Let me show you what can be yours in Jesus Christ. So our evangelism should not be God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Our evangelism should be Jesus is the king. Repent before the king, or you will perish. You do what you want to me. It's not, it's not a, a message from, from fear, from self-preservation, from trying to be liked, trying to be winsome. We do want to be winsome in the sense of removing unnecessary obstacles, right? I want you to, to see my love for people around me. I want you to not be driven away by the fact that I, I call you names or something like that. And, and is there a time to call names? I mean, Jesus does. Prophets do. But you get what I'm driving at. If it's just the flesh, if it's just, I'm on my high horse and I'm insulting people because it's fun, then that, sure, that's an obstacle to the gospel. But my goal is not to water things down enough that people are going to come in. Them coming in, that's a moving of God's power. That's his job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Our job is to be faithful to tell the truth. And that is that Jesus reigns. He rose from the dead. Nobody else did. His authority is the authority that vanquished death. Nobody else's does. You will answer to him. You cannot defeat him. He already already beat death. If he can handle death, he can handle you. So kiss the son, his wrath to turn, lest you perish in the way. And if you are willing to kiss the son, if you are ready to flee from the wrath to come, then I have good news for you.